Looking for a side of sleaze with your monster movie? Well, today's movie has you covered. Or uncovered. I mean, work with me here. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Barbara Peters' controversial exploitation flick, Humanoids from the Deep. Released in 1980, Humanoids from the Deep was controversial because after filming was completed, producer Roger Corman insisted the movie needed more gore and nudity. As such, the humanoids from the title became the thirstiest creatures from the Black Lagoon ever. Which didn't sit well with some of the cast and crew. Corman commissioned reshoots to up the sleaze factor, and that's why Humanoids sort of feels like two different movies spliced into one. But enough about that. Can Humanoids from the Deep fill five barf bags with body parts? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons RJ Ripley, Andy Bell, and LaVon Tao. Sorry if I butchered anyone's name. If you'd like to sponsor some videos, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment in the description below. And now, let's get bloody. We fade in on this underwater shot. This better not be Cruel Jaws. Monster, I thought this was called Humanoids from the Deep. And how small did that font need to be? It's like they're ashamed of it. Turns out, Monster is one of the film's many alternate titles. This is the uncut version of the film. Starring Doug McClure. You might remember him from movies like David vs. Super Goliath and Give My Remains to Broadway. And Vic Morrow. Guessing this was a better experience than working with John Landis. Too soon? Oh look, it's Chief Brody driving to work on Amity Island. Fair warning, Humanoids from the Deep is gonna rip off Jaws pretty hard here in the early going. This card feels like the anchor lineup on the evening news. Channel 12 Action News, your number one news source with anchors Megan King and Breck Costin. Don Maxwell with the AccuWeather forecast and Ho Cow on sports. Huh, music by James Horner. Wonder if he left this on his resume after he won an Oscar. I like the decision to basically just film the drive to the set before we start the movie. Well, guess we might as well get this thing started. Hi, I'm Doug McClure. You might remember me from movies like The Erotic Adventures of Hercules and Dig Your Own Grave and Save. Look, you're gonna get a lot of Troy McClure jokes in this video. Best just to accept it. Then this happens. Hey, how's the beer, Deke? Oh, it's starting to itch real good, Tommy. But don't shave that shaggy mess until we fill all our holes, okay? You got it. Um, what the hell? Shaggy mess? That dude barely has stubble. That's no beard. This is a beard. And here's Vic Morrow rocking the 70s Donald Sutherland perm. Then this guy sails in to deliver some exposition. Jim, there ain't enough fish out there for me to pay for my gas. Well, counters mean progress for times like ours. And progress means money. But I'll tell you one thing, you're not gonna stand in our way. So basically, what I'm getting here is this is the Simpsons episode where they make little Lisa slurry. I figured if one six-pack holder will catch one fish, a million sewn together will catch a million fish. I call it the Burns Omni Net. Here we get one of the earliest examples of James Horner borrowing music. You can almost hear the John Williams. <laughs> Oh damn, I forgot the credits were still going. Here's Barbara Peters making her feature debut. Fun fact, Roger Corman was unhappy with Peters' version of the film. He wanted more kills and naked women, so he had a second unit shoot all the nudity and sex scenes. When Peters found out, she wanted her name removed from the project. She has since come around on the film. They hired the actual Gordon's Fisherman for this shot. Who <laughs> says Roger Corman was cheap? Anyway, let's get back to ripping off Jaws. Smitty! Get the engine started. Amish Quinn can't even get the boat to run. There's no oil pressure, Deke. I guess the damn pump's finally gone out. And the kid goes into the water. I sure hope his name is Bob. It's a really bold move using the kid as bait. I'll give the movie this, I did not expect them to kill a kid. Then Amish Quint basically finds himself in one of those hilarious infomercials where the character has a completely improbable series of blunders. Nearby, Doug McClure is like, guess they won't need me to show them my work on mothballing your battleship. I mean, you can't blame the humanoids for that one. They blew themselves up. We then jump to Doug's house, where he's fishing for children? The boat don't just blow up for no reason at all, Jim. The bucko leaked oil like a sieve, eh? Hey? After some jibber-jabber, this kid's like, I want out of this movie. Outside, someone's left the fog machine on the London during World War II setting, and the dog runs into this monster. <laughs> Come on, Fido, let me help you out. That dog might be a pescatarian. The next day, Doug's wife walks right into this jump scare. 
You could say this is a real cat house. And they find this slime all over their trash. Probably just really horny snails. You should Google it. I love that Doug just flicks the slime off like it's a booger and doesn't even go wash his hands. That's some hygiene right there. Turns out he's got a surprise for her. He's taken her to a screening of Gladys and the Groovy Mule. Their search for the dog takes them all the way to the water. Sure doesn't look like he's here. I'd like to point out that Doug McClure's hair looks like a feat of architectural genius. He's got feathers and poofy bouffants and like multiple parts. Top notch old guy hair for sure. And then they find Baron. This was no boating accident. Back in town, Vic Morrow's showing how sophisticated he is. I drink my beer out of a can, out of a cup. Like, what the hell even is that? And it turns out Doug McClure isn't the only guy taking a trip to the pet cemetery. There's a lot of dead dogs around here. This was also not a boating accident. In fact, Vic Morrow has suspicions. That's funny. The only dog left alive is the Indians. Boys, we got ourselves a problem. Over in another movie, we've got a creepy peeper. She investigates, but all she finds is the super rare double jump scare. <laughs> Turns out the phone call is just Roger Corman asking if she can do this scene topless. She's still creeping around the house and I'm calling a party foul because this bar has no J&B. Then it's time for another jump scare. What the hell are you doing? She almost stuck a fork in Budget Chachi here. Wait, Budget Scott Bayo is just Scott Bayo at this point, right? Then we jump over here. Salmon Festival? That sounds pretty official. I wonder who they got to sponsor it this year. Doug McClure only showed up because he thinks it's the premiere of his new movie, Lead Paint, Delicious But Deadly. Inside, we're treated to the musical stylings of Booger Nugget and the Pickers. I'm glad Doug at least dressed up for this. His jacket definitely rose to the occasion. Things are looking up at least. They have Milton Berle here to do a set. Do you kids even remember Milton Berle? Christ, I'm old. Turns out this is like one of those Bob Hope USO tours, because next up is Budget Farrah Fawcett. They've got the handle on how to make salmon grow bigger, faster, and twice as plentiful. Back at the mic, Milton's really bringing his A material. I'm 83 and I feel like a 20 year old, but unfortunately there's never one around. Clearly these two weren't impressed by that joke, judging by this no emote showdown. At any rate, the party's going great until Bob shows up with his dead dog. Look, Bob, I know the invite said and guest, but we didn't mean old Yeller. This is the only party where a dead dog would actually liven things up. I'm gonna stop your cannery, Slattery. But I'm gonna do it by the law. Your law! Since the dog is stinking up the joint, Vic decides it's time to move things outside. It's upsetting the folks. Get him out of here. Think of this party started with an appetizer of pimp hand. The brawl escalates and I'd like to take a moment so we can all appreciate these absolutely awful punches Vic Morrow is throwing. Vic Morrow is Tommy Gunn in Rocky V. Doug McClure is not to be outdone though. He gets in on the action too. Let me show you some of the moves I learned while filming Today We Kill, Tomorrow We Die. Honestly, this is how the Salmon Festival ends every year. All right, boys, that'll be about enough. Now pick yourselves up and go on home. The next day, Vic's out playing with his dinghy. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, not like that, you pervs. He's riding in this tiny boat. Then he's skulking about like a ninja so he can eavesdrop on this exposition. What can we do to stop him now? File suit against Noyo County for violation of our treaty fishing rights. You can sort of tell that Humanoids from the Deep is two movies. We've got this serious eco-thriller Peter thought she was making, but soon we'll have the creatures from the Black Lagoon running around ripping ladies' tops off and procreating with them. It's all pretty weird. Case in point, we then jump to these two lovebirds doing some heavy petting. They're so oblivious they don't even notice something's afoot. I will say it is nice he put on his fancy cutoffs for this date though. Eventually they wind up in the water and well, you know what's gonna happen. <laughs> His girlfriend flees, but our horny sea monster has other things in mind. This is a real drag. Oh my god, look at this thing. It's like she's getting assaulted by the Gorn from that old Star Trek episode. Then Johnny Eagle shows up at the dock to talk to Doug. Man, I just wanted to tell you how much I loved your work and dial M for murderousness. Back on the beach, it looks like someone's pitching a tent. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, not like that, you pervs. These people are camping. And you totally know this is a movie because no dude ever got a chick to take her clothes off by doing a ventriloquist act. Hey honey, want to see my woodpecker? It's definitely hard to tell who's more wooden in this scene though. Well Chuck, works every time. What did you do without me? Well, just watch. 
And then the humanoids attack. I'd love to show you more, but this footage is too titillating. After all that excitement, we're treated to what may be the slowest boat chase scene in history. Will they break 10 miles an hour? Somehow, they dock at night. But Vic Morrow is still following them in the daylight. Continuity is hard. Later on, Budget Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia are having some solo time. <laughs> Shouldn't these two have been in Cormorant's Battle Beyond the Stars instead? Then Vic Morrow tosses the most explosive Molotov cocktail in history. <laughs> He's like the Ford Pinto of Molotovs, apparently. Seriously, I've seen less explosive nukes than this. Luke grabs a blaster, but then one of the creatures grabs him. I don't think he's going to be able to force his way out of this one. <laughs> Leia doesn't fare much better, because apparently Michael Myers is on the roof of that pickup. And there's one in the back of the truck, too. He's a real backseat driver. And then the truck explodes like the Death Star. <laughs> The next day, Doug's ready to get to the bottom of things. I need a mate, Slattery. How about it? Whoa, whoa, slow down, Doug. You guys haven't even been on a date yet. Doug heads off with Johnny Eagle and Dolores Montenegro to begin principal photography on Here Comes the Coast Guard. I told you there were going to be a billion Troy McClure jokes in this episode, and I wasn't fucking around. I will say it's nice that with all the stuff going on, they still found time to get in a little fishing trip. Meanwhile, here's a live look inside my aquarium. Back on land, they've either wandered into the aftermath of yet another explosion, or Cheech and Chong are having a beach day. Then they find this. Maybe these guys are just smoking themselves. Look, I know some people think the monster costumes look silly, but I'm gonna disagree. These look pretty great to me, and they came courtesy of FX legend Rob Bottin. He worked on a little film you may have heard of called The Thing. After they kill the monsters, Dr. Drake decides to snap some boudoir photos for the upcoming issue of Fish Fancy. And they found the girl from earlier. She's enjoying a really great spa day with a seaweed wrap. But surprise, there's one more still alive. John Eagle's like, spears to you, pal. Back at the lab, they're performing an autopsy on Swamp Thing. And acting. Mr. Borden strongly suggests that we keep this quiet until Kenko has had a chance to review it. Your theory could be totally incorrect. Budget Pam Dauber here is really pissed. I've been trying to tell you people about this for a long time and you pushed it aside. Well, look at it, Edworth. It's right in front of you. You stupid ass. Look at it. And now it's time for stock footage science. Doug's like, wait, is this meeting you, Partners in Freedom? I was in that one. And if you guess the humanoids from the deep are going to stage their big attack at the festival, well, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. And somehow Booger Nugget and the Pickers got booked for another gig. Doug and Johnny Eagle dump the carcass out on the dock, and that's when the humanoids attack. This guy's like, come on, give Squidward a hug. So, fun fact, they apparently only had one full humanoid costumes and parts of a few others. Because of this, you couldn't have more than three humanoids in a scene, and they had to be filmed from the right angles to hide the unfinished parts. The mutants are running wild. It's like an H.P. Lovecraft movie up in here at this point. Anyway, carnage is ensuing, and this one grabs Roller Girl. I think we're about to be treated to some interspecies erotica. And they've clearly trained in pro wrestling. Here's a back body drop and a lapel lock. <laughs> Meanwhile, Doug McClure is like, I'm out of here. Hey, remember Doug's kid who ran out of the movie earlier? Well, turns out he's still in this movie after all. He's still a big crybaby, though. Back at the dock, the mutants are closing in on Miss Salmon. Look, I don't know any woman who'd want to be known as Miss Salmon. Just insert your own obvious joke here. She's going to fight him topless, and again, just take my word for it because Prude Tube hates breasts. I don't even have a joke for this, but young Arnold Horshack just hit a mutant with a flaming spear, and there's no way I couldn't show it. If you're wondering where Vic Morrow got off to, he's over here saving these kids. That <laughs> seems weirdly prophetic. But Vic's in trouble too, until Johnny Eagle saves him. I guess this means they're frenemies now. I can't quit you, Johnny Eagle. Oh look, it's the end of Halloween Kills. Where's the lady with the iron? Evil dies tonight! Back at home, Mrs. Doug McClure is in danger. I think they really traumatized this kid. It's like murder set pieces. With the kid's stash, they do battle one-on-one. -on -one. I'm glad she turned the lights off and it's no darker inside the house. That seems useful. After some cat and mouse, the humanoids make their move. And judging from this shot, I think this humanoid from the deep needs glasses. Then she douses him with drain cleaner and goes all Mrs. Bates on him. And now that she's got a taste for killing, she's ready for her next victim. Except it's Doug. He's like, you might remember me from our wedding photos. And the next day, things are looking great. If this is how they run the Salmon Festival, I can't wait to see what they do for Arbor Day. But I feel like there's a swerve ending coming. And here it comes. The movie got tired of ripping off Jaws, so now it's on to Alien. This is why you never eat a chalupa during labor. That 
gross. <laughs> it sure is, Billy. It sure is. And that's Humanoids from the Deep. As I've mentioned, this is a strange little film. Or more accurately, two strange little films stitched into one. I can understand Peters and star Ann Turkle being annoyed by the addition of sex and violence after the fact, but honestly, Corman's insistence on more gore and nudity is mostly why we still talk about this film. The somber eco-thriller elements are turgid at best, but the idea of a pack of malevolent fishmen lusting after nubile co-eds is definitely entertaining. Roger Corman has survived in this business for decades because he knows what the audience wants. And he was right here. But did his post-principal photography meddling add enough splatter to make this one a five barf bag sick flick? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Humanoids from the Deep delivers. We're treated to multiple gash wounds, ripped off faces, a decapitation, and that gooey alien chestburster ripoff scene. There's definitely enough gore here to give Humanoids from the Deep a three barf bag rating. If you argued it could get a four, I wouldn't entirely disagree with you. This one's a fun little sick flick. Looking for more mutant monsters? Then be sure to check out my review of Feast. You'll find a link here on the screen after my outtakes. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters. And today we're tackling Barbara Peters' controversial exploitation flick, Humanoids from the Deep. Ooh, that sounded like I smoked a carton of cigarettes. These look pretty great to me, and they come courtesy of ex uh, My allergies today are not helping. <sighs> they look like I'm crying. Channel 12, Action News, with your dumb... Oh, God damn it. When I have to read and perform is when we get into trouble. <laughs> I'd say let's finish strong, but that would imply we started strong, and we all know that is not true.